I'm Sue Ellen Roberts from Dallas. Welcome to our program. I'm so glad that you've joined us. We've got a great program for you today. Our special guest is Natalie Nichols. In 1991, at 20 years old, Natalie was a senior honor student at Baylor University, a talented musician and gifted motivational speaker. In a matter of weeks, an undiagnosed illness suddenly progressed, taking her on a downward spiral. Finally, in 1996, after eight years of increasing illness, a correct diagnosis was made late stages of Lyme disease. By this time, there was little left, and that resembled the 18-year-old who had begun the journey. Welcome, Natalie. I'm just so glad that you are here to join Thank us you. and tell your story to us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, too. Well, we just, uh, you're sitting here beautiful, lovely, and just Thank conversing, you. and it's just so hard to believe that you had a deadly disease. Uh, it's just a miracle. It is. Yeah. It is. I just wanted to have you tell your story to the viewers and start with you were in the Miss Te uh, Texas pageant. How did all that happen? Uh, well, actually, uh, just um, by divine providence, I guess. I was taking voice lessons from someone who had uh, a previous Miss Texas, had been a choreographer in his music department at the university where he taught. And when I was taking voice lessons from him, he just seemed like I would enjoy it, uh, which was true. He suggested that I might uh, perhaps get involved in that. And he was right. I really did enjoy it. My temperament was very suited for that environment and the discipline and the um, coaching for the talent and interview and, you know, of course. I mean, how can a girl not like having makeup artists and and, you know, dress designers pick out, you know, the most perfect thing out of thousands of color red, let's find the exact color. So, you know, what girl would it not suit, probably? Yes. So it was really uh, fun and uh, uh, very, it was rewarding and it benefited me in, a, in many, many areas in my life. It was a really good training ground and a training ground that I intended to pursue because you know that pageants are sort of like a university. It's a, at least a three-year program for maybe even five-year program. So you don't just go and win, at least on the state level, usually. Uh, not one as large as Miss Texas. You don't go and win your first year. Oh, really? So, really? I didn't yeah. realize that. That's interesting that you say that. And you wound up being runner-up, was it, for Miss Texas? Oh, I wish. <laughs> Anyway, you were in it. <laughs> I was in it, and I, I was runner-up to somebody uh -huh. who was pretty far down the yeah. line. As I started going back the next year, I did much better, and, you know, the experience um, under my belt, it helped a lot. Yes. So. Oh, I'm sure. And, and uh, part of the talent, you, you play the piano beautifully, and, and uh, I know we have some clips that have been, uh, but it's, a, it's amazing with the gifts and talents that you do have, how you were able to use those over the years. I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, as a senior, in your senior year at Baylor, you were an honor student. What happened? Um, well, actually, um, I began having, it just creeped up on me. I began having a burning arm pain uh, a little bit prior to Miss Texas, but I really just ignored it, and I had a stiff neck, and I was exercising a tremendous amount not sleeping, trying to keep up with school and the pageant. And in fact, it blows my mind now to think I would drive an hour and a half from Waco to Fort Worth just to exercise with a trainer, turn around and go right back to Waco. It, was, mm. it just blows my mind. So I was tired and I just, I attributed it to that. But, um, and I went through the pageant and really in all other aspects, feeling the best that I had felt in my life, the most energetic, and uh, just um, in the brightest mood and most able to capitalize on every moment of life, just really felt great. But about four weeks after the pageant, when I uh, began taking a summer school course, I began having burning pain in my forearms and hands. And I just you know, ignored it, but it was, it was really painful. And then as time for fall study drew near at Baylor and everything gets back into normal gear, I was, although I was a voice major uh, under a music education degree, 
I also studied piano because that was the love of my life. I'd started it since I was four years old and had just lived on the piano basically, four to six hours a day practice. I just loved it. Well, the pain was really preventing me from playing, mm. and my professor at that time was really quite concerned and didn't think it was advisable to keep going. So she sent me to a hand specialist uh, there in Waco where the university is, and he said that it was probably tendonitis and just to rest it, gave me all sorts of hand braces to sleep in and did biofeedback and all sorts of things. And uh, so I rested my hand, I did all my coursework orally, my professors let me do tests on a recorder, even they were very accommodating. However, a year later, it was no better at all. And in that process of uh, you know, it not improving, I had seen another internist in my hometown who thought it was lupus, and the tests really seemed to indicate that. I'd been to a fibro um, rheumatologist in Dallas, a very well-known, respected rheumatologist. And we were expecting him to confirm lupus. My parents went with me. And he said, uh, we, you know, our fears were just uh, put to rest when he said it was um, just because I was a type A personality, you know, just to chill out, enjoy life, don't worry about grades, and it would get better. But it didn't. Mm -hmm. So it just kept I know, for eight years, mm -hmm. you went undiagnosed. What were those eight years like? Well, the year, uh, the next year following, uh, you know, the arm pain and the neck pain, then it began to be constitutional. Almost exactly a year, I was fatigued and drowsy and very foggy brained. I would read a paragraph 30 times and still not know what it said. And so physicians advised that I withdraw from school, so I withdrew just a couple of courses in semester of student teaching short of, of graduation. And uh, from there it just kept progressing. Uh, one year, after another. It just kept getting worse and worse. And the year following that, I began to develop neurological symptoms uh, to the degree that you know, multiple sclerosis was highly suspected, myasthenia gravis, all sorts of things. And I was, um, had to get a wheelchair for the first time when leaving the house so weak I couldn't really speak above a whisper, hold my eyelids open, feed myself, and stayed really in that very weak state for three years, a very bed-bound and weak. However, what really made the disease um, advance for me, what was into such an unbearable state, was that in seeking a diagnosis, a spinal tap was done because I had so many neurological symptoms. And uh, after that spinal tap, for some reason, the disease, although it was apparently affecting my brain, took a different, um, I don't just a different mechanism of action in my brain and it caused such agony that I really I didn't see how I could live a week with it I began to feel like I was being electrocuted or burned alive in my brain where where you feel thoughts and I began wailing and writhing and we did several things in case the spinal tap was leaking you know to, to thinking that would be the solution and be the remedy and it didn't affect it at all and when it first got to that state, and we are at this point four years after the Miss Texas pageant, and when it when that first happened, I just remember thinking, God, if you can get me one week until my appointment with the specialist, and he has definitely got to figure this out. You know, you will have done a great thing if you can get me that far. And yet, that doctor had no answer, and three years later, I was still in the same state. You say we. Who's we? that you certainly didn't suffer this all, all, all by yourself. Uh, who, who was with you during this time? Well, I was, I was married at the time, and uh, of course something that, um, uh, that dramatic and such a large scale, you know, it's very hard for a spouse, very difficult. He was very helpful for a number of years, and so I lived in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. My parents lived in East Texas. My mother, at the time that this really began to affect my brain so severely, my mother sold her business and drove up every week the four and a half hour drive to care for me during the week. And she would mm -hmm. return home and care for her elderly parents on the weekend. But uh, she was very much there every minute of the day. And nights were very long for me and I dreaded waking up the next day. And so my, I, I can't imagine having 
uh, gone through it without my mom. How wonderful that she was there to support yes. you. Were you aware yes. at the time of all this? I mean, were you cognitive in, in your emotions and to know that that her she was there loving you and supporting you through through this uh, disease? I definitely, definitely, yes, remember times. And even though it um, it seemed to other people that there was no one inside, especially after uh, I was put on very high dose steroids when a doctor suspected brain infection and before my diagnosis was made. Uh, that being the worst thing that can be done for Lyme disease, of course, made the infection run rampant because Lyme is a bacterial infection and other types of infections you get from a tick bite. So if you give high dose steroids that suppress the immune system, then what else does the infection do but just run rampant and do very, very serious damage. So especially when I was high, on high dose steroids and from that point on uh, for three years, I just screamed like an animal, I behaved like an animal, I lived the mm. majority of the time on the floor, either in the dark in a closet with my face next to a baseboard and I screamed, just screamed bloody murder so loud that you know all the dogs in the neighborhood would hear and join in with me. So. Though, um, and I would have, you know, there would be weeks or moments spread months apart where I could be lucid, and there were those moments, and I would, could carry on conversation. In large part, uh, you know, other people would think there was not really a normal human being in there, especially considering that physicians urged my parents to put me in an institution three different times. They urged my parents to do that and just get on with their lives. And my parents didn't feel like that was. Uh, God's ultimate plan for me and neither did I so but yes even in that really severe time I have very clear memories even when other people have said other family members a brother of mine came one time to visit and said after that told my family he just didn't think he could come back because I seemed like such a vegetable and yet I remember him looking at me I remember him stroking my hair I remember him crying I remember that his wife was just about nine months pregnant she had on a red plaid dress and I remember what I was doing, and yet to everyone else, it, there was just, Natalie was not in there. Yes. Oh, my. Mm -hmm. My, my. In uh, 1996, was it, you were diagnosed. What was the diagnosis? What did they say? And why did it take eight years? Well, uh, I had been tested for Lyme disease a number of times. It was suspected several times by a, a very um, intuitive physician here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. However, at that time it was believed that tests could prove whether someone had Lyme disease. And we know now that typical tests aren't reliable. It's really a clinical diagnosis. However, the way that my diagnosis came about was just divine providence. It was God working in an unreal way. But a research microbiologist at Wayne State University had my blood testing for other things. And she cultured uh, the spirochete that causes Lyme disease. And so that's how So it, it was a about. fluke almost. They weren't testing for, the, for Lyme, they were testing right. for something else. Right. And since it came about that way, and since it had already been turned down so many times as a mm -hmm. diagnosis, mm -hmm. when that word came down to us, my family and me, it just, it just didn't seem real. It didn't seem like for that much damage and that much devastation, how could a little bit of tick bite do that? Mm. Mm. And so it was hard to believe and hard to accept. So we went ahead with the treatment. But it just, you know, it took years to come to grips with the fact that Lyme disease could actually do that. Mm -hmm. So we began the IV antibiotics and all the things that are supposed to help it. And in the first few weeks, I did experience a little bit of improvement. But I couldn't really continue with that treatment enough um, to, to sustain that improvement. Mm -hmm. And I went right back into that severe dementia for two more years. Why? Mm -hmm. In and through it, what did God do in you? Natalie, and what is God doing now? Mm. I'll, I'll go with the first one. I, send, I, I asked you two questions. What did God do as you look back? Uh, uh, how did he, through that experience, uh, what happened in your life? I got to know him uh, in a way I couldn't have any other way. I mean, my self-sufficiency ended and I couldn't exist autonomous of God. There was no way. 
And even though I went into this um, having faith in God, being a believer in Jesus Christ, my father was a Southern Baptist pastor all of my life, and I was even in ministry prior to this, um, I, I still could not have fathomed before I went into it knowing the God of the universe the way I came to know Him. I, I, and, um, you know, it's hard to say, but this side of it, looking back, I would definitely choose to do it again because that treasure of knowing Him is more valuable than anything else that I uh, could ever have. And, you know, so many things seemed to be going my way through the Miss Texas pageant. I'd never considered different careers as far as television and communications and and you know I had scholarships for graduate degrees and I was having great talent coaching so many different avenues of life were opening up and the stage of my life literally seemed absolutely prepared and then it all went down the drain but compared to what I I got in place of it it, it was nothing just completely worthless compared to knowing my Savior knowing Jesus Christ because when when my strength ended, you know, his began. And when I put my faith in Jesus Christ and believed that he was God's son, came to earth, who lived a sinless life, died to pay the penalty for my sins, rose again so that I could live with him eternally, you know, his spirit came and, and was conceived within me and lived within me. But I didn't really let him live like he could. There was so much of Natalie living in his place, you know? And when Natalie was taken away, there was so much more of him in me. And he gave me his joy. You know, who I would go from one minute wanting to die. And you know, Sue Ellen, I was looking at my journal even last night and reading a, 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 a passage where I wrote, if I could only find enough pills to swallow, I wouldn't have to do this anymore. Hmm. And things that just, I mean, poems that I wrote, you know, even a, that all around, the, the, the chains go around and all they bind, even a prisoner is the mind, and just total darkness and despair. And I would just want to die. And to cry out in my pain, which is not an unrealistic thing to do, you know, even for God, Jesus cried out in pain on the cross. But this is where I would just, I would know that he was living in me and not me because all of a sudden, if I would just open a passage of scripture or just even call on him and just say, help, help, I cannot do this. And all of a sudden, there was a joy in me, a peace in me, and um, uh, an ability to, to find pleasure in the moment and to even be thankful. And he was my best friend, my companion, and yes, he, it was God's provision that my family was there, that medicine was there in so many different ways, but in the areas that even pain and medicine and family could not penetrate, that, that deep area of agony and electrocution and wanting to die, that is where he could get, where no one else could. And. Um, he, he just, I don't, human words can hardly describe it. Well, you're doing a wonderful job of conveying your heart. What would you recommend to our viewers who have suffered and are going through suffering? Perhaps they have a loved one. As you, for so many years that were ill and they're struggling, what would you recommend to them? Well, I... I would definitely say plant your feet on the rock. You know, Scripture, um, Jesus told a certain parable in Matthew 7 about a man who was wise and built his house on the rock. And when the winds came, just as we've recently seen with so many hurricanes in Florida and then in, in the New Orleans, Mississippi area and then in Houston, and we've seen very strong winds come. We've seen rivers rise and streams rise. And uh, Jesus told in that parable that when the house was built on the rock, when the, when the rains came, the winds blew and the streams rose, the house did not fall. However, there was someone who'd built their house on the sand. 
And when all of that storm came, that house was destroyed. And so I would say definitely find that rock in Jesus Christ because that is the only thing that kept me standing. And not only did it keep me standing, and when I say the rock, I mean a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if once you've believed in Him and, and placed your faith in Him and He's come and dwelled in you and given you eternal life, He promises life abundant. And so just to call on Him, to, to, to dwell in His Word, open the Scriptures and read. And those Scriptures, the Bible, we put it on the shelf and think it's a great historical document or it's a wonderful religious thing to do on Easter. And Christmas, but I'm telling you, that book on the shelf is organic. It possesses life. And there is a scripture in Hebrews that tells us that, that the Word, the Bible, is alive and active, and it possesses energy, and it is very capable of working in our lives. In fact, the term it's used for that was a term used in secular society to describe a medicine that was effectively engaged in the work it was designed to do. And so God's Word is designed to be that rock for us. And it was that rock for me. It gave me my perspective, my joy. It was my strength. It was what kept me going and gave me the true perspective of the way things really were and to see things from eternal perspective and to value what really is a value. We have things so backwards. We value things that are worthless. And to really value what is of eternal, long-lasting importance changes, changes our um, experience dramatically. Mm, it sure does. It really does, Natalie. And unfortunately, we have to begin to close out our show. But I want to ask you, now you're sitting here healed in marvelous health, physical health. And what are you doing? What, what, uh, what's on the uh, horizons for you? What are you doing now? Are you traveling, speaking? What's, what's I, happening in your life? I am, but I do want to say um, that yes, compared to what I was like, I have made a marvelous improvement, and I'm sure you know, that's very evident through the clips and the videotape, but for those who are still left with a, a weakness or struggling with an illness, I, I do still take over 100 pills a day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on a great deal of medication, but yes, I'm functional. Mm -hmm. And so I am traveling and speaking and uh, um, president and founder of um, a ministry, and we have outreach ministries out of that. What's the name um, of your ministry? Shades of Grace Ministries. Wonderful, and I know that you can be reached through our website, yes. and they can find out more about you to contact you for uh, speaking and whatever door uh, uh, God opens for you. I just, I'm just so appreciative of you being here and telling your story because it's your life and what you've lived through and what God has brought you through. But most importantly, what I see is what God has done in you and how you are blessing others. It's just tremendous, Natalie, and I'm just... I just think it's fantastic. You know, God does that. Scripture says that He comforts us so we can comfort others. And so anyone who's yeah. dealing with a difficulty, God will do that with yeah. them. Yeah, I appreciate that. Well, thanks for letting us share this time with you. And thanks for spending this time with us. And remember, God loves you and cares about you. And we're just so glad that you joined us today.